Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to The Take Up. Today we have episode 55, Embroidery Digitizing, Art and Science, plus some design deconstruction. Hey everybody, good afternoon, and welcome to The Take Up. I'm glad to have you in here on this wonderful Friday, Embroidery Education Friday, as we often say. Uh, happy to have you guys in here. Happy to see you showing up to learn some interesting stuff. I know last week we went pretty deep into uh, business ideas, segments we can work on, things like that. We really went into where we would sell, how we make money with embroidery. Today, I know lots of people are saying we want to get into some more digitizing content, some artistic content, some creative content. Well, we're going to do that today. Uh, certainly going to go into, I wouldn't say the argument between the art and the science of embroidery digitizing, but there's a little art versus science. There's also a little bit of creation versus interpretation we're going to talk about. But we're also talking about the things from the aesthetic kind of side of the world, the artistic side of the world that I think are interesting for us to know are worthwhile for us to think about. And then things that are technical, that are scientific, that are interesting for us to know about in the terms of how we digitize for embroidery, how we interpret art into embroidery. And if, <laughs> if we get time for it, the other plus is we will do a little design deconstruction. I have a piece that Many of you may have seen at the trade shows, and I actually have the piece, the canonical piece that was taken photographs of, this carousel piece, and I may be getting into this. There are some other pieces people have asked me to break down, and so we will do some other stuff. And here's the thing I'm going to say. I'm going to break down this big, fairly detailed piece. Talk to me if you want to see me do logo breakdowns of something that's smaller. There's totally room for me to do some discussion of the decisions we make for smaller left chest logo type designs, other types of designs, and let me know what kind of designs you'd like to see me break down, what kind of techniques you'd like to see me break down. So, you know, we'll see how that works. We're going to see how that turns out. We might not get time for that today. If not, then next week very likely will be some design deconstruction stuff. But for today, I wanted to have some discussions about, like I said, the art and science, kind of the different ways in which we look at embroidery digitizing, we look at interpretation, we look at the way we handle the medium itself, uh, predicated on a couple different questions people had. Uh, number one, I had I have had over the years some people come to me saying essentially uh, hand embroidery or even hand guided machine embroidery is somehow uh, more artistic, more creative than perhaps digitized embroidery. I would like to say that's not the case and I'd like to fight for that a little bit and discuss why that is. Uh, and also because I've had some people ask me, how much art training do I need to digitize? What is important about maybe some sort of creative training, art design training that do I think it falls into the realm of embroidering and digitizing? And for people who are coming from the creative and artistic side, what does it really mean to grasp embroidery digitizing instead of saying, okay, well, I've done the art portion, but what can I then rely on a digitizer to do? So there's a lot There's a lot of interplay there. I'm going to discuss the kinds of things I think they're important from both sides and what I think it takes to get together to do, what do we always say on this, on this show, to have a holistic look at embroidery, to have stitch consciousness, to know what stitches do to, but also to have an artistic and design consciousness to understand the elements that we're playing with as far as kind of the visual medium, of, as far as the images we're looking at and what it, what makes sense for us to understand as say digitizers, embroiderers, even if we aren't creating original art ourselves necessarily. And some of us are, I mean, I designed some stuff. We can talk about that certainly later, but we'll get into it. Let's first just go ahead and say hello to some folks. I always like to call you out and recognize my reciprocators when you show up, you guys give back and I wanna give back to you. So first, Frank showing up as he shows up to many of the shows out in the UK, man, I hope you're doing well. Good evening to everybody out that way. Tom Farr of Buzzards Bay Embroidery and a trainer of his own right, as well as an embroidery digitizer and embroiderer. Great to see you in, Tom. Uh, Joe Rita, who's been doing awesome landscape work. Glad to see you in, Joe Rita. Mary Ann from Santa Fe, New Mexico, a fellow New Mexican like myself. Happy to see you in, Mary Ann. John, good afternoon. Glad to see you made it through your birthday safe and sound. Yeah, close enough. <laughs> close enough. Did some damage on the way in, but, you know, I'm, I'm doing all right. Uh, B Thrash, hello from Summerton, South Carolina. I hope the E body is doing well. Uh, yeah, the knee is starting to be better. Anybody who knows what happened, I, I messed up my knee trying to uh, take this rather overly large body and work out a little too fast. And it turns out uh, my patella did not agree with that, <laughs> that assessment of how I should get started. I'm healing up and I'll be back on uh, getting a little healthier as this next year of my life goes on. Uh, Jeff Fuller of uh, Fuller Embroidery Works and Embroidery Nerd. Really cool stuff they're doing out there. They do a lot of digitizing training and discussion of people's designs, uh, breakdowns. Check out their group. Hello, Jeff. 
Christine Shree, friend of the show and of the Women of Business podcast. Good afternoon, Eric. Are you tired of being on camera yet? You know, I don't know if I ever get tired of being on camera because I know, despite the fact that I don't like all this, <laughs> I'm not very fond of having to show all of this on camera. Uh, at, at the same time, I know that I'm hopefully bringing you guys some value and some things that are are inspirational, that are helping you think about the way you do your work and, and help you out. If I'm helping people, then I'll be on camera all day. But, you know, I've, I've got some other stuff to do. I will say this. Um, it is hard sometimes while I'm on camera not to want to run into a task I'm doing, not to show you something I'm working on that I probably can't show you or to digitize live on things that I'm working on. But uh, suffice it to say, I, I do like being with you all and I really love the uh, interaction we have. Justin Armenta, digitize himself. Hi, all. Happy to see you here. Thank, <laughs> thankful that it's Friday. Gary from North Texas. Finally thought out, man, I am wishing you the best out in Texas and I hope you guys are doing okay. Uh, I definitely saw a lot of my Texas friends having a hard time and I'm, uh, I know thoughts and prayers don't mean a whole lot compared to helping out, but definitely my thoughts are with you guys out there. Yes to Zen from Sweden. Hi, man. I had to see you here again. Thank you for showing up. Lori Zen. Trudy says, Hey, from Green Bay, Wisconsin. First time. We're happy to have you in Trudy. Got a family in Green Bay myself, Green Bay and Alloway and out there. So glad, glad to see you in, uh, Greg Johnson saying hello from Boston. Hello, Greg. Rafael coming in from Scotland. Hi, man. Great digitizer himself. Does incredible work. If you haven't seen his stuff out on the uh, in the groups and Facebook, seen a lot of his stuff and fantastic work, of course. Uh, Cindy from Texas saying, good afternoon. Good afternoon to you. Mary Gale's in. Regina, who I know well, is in. Christine's like, I'm just on camera a lot today, three times so far. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Fridays are a busy day for me, and, and especially because uh, two regular guys, if you haven't seen it this morning, we had um, Scott Ritter of the DAX shows on, and he gave an incredibly good presentation on uh, the kind of forms and managing of information, it's something that I've taught many times, workflow and information in embroidery shops and in general in decoration shops. Great stuff. So check out the tworegularguys.com if you want to see that show this morning. And I, I did jump in. The, the joke was that I am usually in the background, and he was saying, uh, you know, oh, you summon Eric by saying his name three times. So every time they said my name three times, I popped up on camera. So, you know, always good fun here. Don saying hello, gang. Good to be here. Happy to see you here, Don. Uh, Nick, yeah, we, a lot of us do digitizing custom patches, my man. <laughs> so I think that's everybody here. But yeah, glad glad you're here to see what's going on. And uh, hopefully you learned something good today that will help out with your digitizing and custom patches. Who knows? But yeah, uh, hello for Clorinda, and we have Jenny. I'm going to go ahead and stop here, guys. We could keep on with this, with saying hi to everybody all afternoon, but I will go ahead and get into the topic that we wanted to start from. First thing I am going to point out, and something I already threw up in the comments, but here it is as well. I've once again got our links list up. This has uh, several resources. A lot of these are actually previous videos from the Take Up because we've gone deep dive on several of these topics and maybe not super deep, but we have jumped in on several topics that we're going to talk about today as far as artistic rendering, as far as things in the design world that I would like to talk about. Not everything I'm going to talk about today is in this links list, but there are some interesting things that are there, which I will refer to and probably show some of these on screen as we get going. There'll be a lot of chatting in the front end because I think it's uh, worthwhile to just kind of have this discussion about the art and science as I always talk about it. And really this is about the aesthetic versus the technical or how these things play off together. But if you go on to that uh, links list, I'll go ahead and pop this up just so you can kind of see what I'm talking about. There are some discussions. My my very initial reason where I, I use the term kind of the art and the science of embroidery here, uh, Mr. X Stitch, a lot of people come into that, especially from the craft and the uh, technical side there. We also have a couple episodes that I went into things like color selection and theory. This one actually has some great stuff uh, from some graphic designers embedded in it. And the links list on this show is actually pretty uh, pretty good for learning some color theory and things like that. We have uh, shape creation and mark making, how we make shapes in embroidery, how we sh make shapes for digitizing, and how we make marks, how we use the line values of embroidery thread to make marks, to sh make shapes, to make line and value. Um, also, embroidery, uh, machine embroidery analysis on this one, episode 23, where we talk a little bit about a not only analysis, but what I always call scientific stitching, the way that we test the way that we analyze existing designs to help us inform our settings, our stitched styles, our technique to help us learn from other folks who are doing great work. And also you'll see some other great stuff. Um, this piece from Susan Hensel, we're going to talk about this later, came out today. I actually saw this come up in my Facebook feed as I was getting ready for the show and had to show it to you. Fine artist doing embroidery who's talking about all about color values. And we'll talk about that again later, but here's her awesome piece where she discusses uh, color values and substrates. Substrates, you know, of course, being the 
material on which you're stitching and how that affects colors and the way they look. So that's something that I thought was interesting that we'll probably, you know, maybe land on for a little bit. And of course, just a little bit of like uh, how to create texture with lines, just defining some terms about how we use lines to create texture. Because as you know, we're dealing with embroidery, we're dealing with thread and what is thread, but a line, we cannot change the value at least <laughs> with most embroidery technology. Uh, we can we can have the discussion about color reel. It's coming up because I know that people want to talk about color reel and technologies and things that are changing the embroidery field. So uh, there will be a time where I discuss more about color reel and dyeing thread. The thing is, I can bet that nobody on my call today, I'm almost certain nobody on any of my Zoom calls that I've had recently, nobody that I've had in this show we're watching right now probably has a color reel unit dyeing their thread as it runs. If you do have one, hey, let's talk about that. I'd love to know what you're doing with color reel. But the truth of the matter is that's not there yet. And the thing is, until we dye thread as we're running, unless we are using especially thread and then it's not under our control, Thread really is a line. It is a line from point to point. The stitches that our embroidery machines can make are a line from point to point, generally of one value of color, or one color, one value across that range. Like I said, unless we're using variegated thread, unless we're using ombre thread, something else, and even then we can't control where the gradation of color is gonna happen on those. So line value is important to embroiderers because we are essentially using lines. We're drawing with a pen a line that has a single width that we then can stack or change. So that's something we'll discuss as well. But I think that it's it's worthwhile to kind of think about this stuff. So I put it up in the links list, check it out. There's some assets in there for you to look at. There's some earlier episodes if you missed them that might be useful. And honestly, each of the episodes will have a links list or links on that episode that have other assets for you to look at. I always like to kind of let that tree spread. You go down a branch that you're interested in and find all the little places that'll lead you and you'll get out to something that uh, may be more educational for you, more maybe more interesting. But let's go ahead and start into the topic of the day, right? Topic of the day was what? Digitizing the art and the science, right? So the first thing is I'm going to say it's not art versus science. This is not the technical versus the aesthetic. They are not something that's set against each other so much as we need things that are in this artistic design space that we need to know to do our best work. And we absolutely, if we want to do the best embroidery possible, we have technical things we need to know. We have things we need to understand about the nature of machine embroidery, about the nature of our materials, about the way that it's put together in order to get our result, right? We cannot really master embroidery if master is the word for it. And I'd say I'm no master, I'm learning every day. But we cannot get the results we want unless we understand the technical, the science portion of it. If we understand the integration, what I've always said to you guys, if you've been around this show, you've heard it a million times. The integration between needle, thread, machine, file, stabilizer, hoop or gauge, whatever it is, garment construction, all of these things come together and the different ways in which they interact make the finished embroidery piece. We know that even though we're talking about digitizing, the end result of digitizing is never the file. The end result of digitizing is the embroidery. And that being the case, there is no end result that we can judge against our expectations until we have embroidery, until it's in the thread, until it's on fabric. That being what we're aiming for, we have to understand the nature of the thing, the nature of the materials, and we have to understand the technical nature of how we get there in digitizing software, in our planning, in our uh, in our interpretation, technically, how we use the values to get there. But if we want to address things in a way that's not just filling in shapes with stitches at full coverage, if we want to do anything more than that, if we're not just doing the coloring book version of digitizing, the automated version of digitizing, which is see a shape, fill a shape with stitches, no matter how they look, sew it out. And even then we're gonna encounter all these technical problems. But if we wanna go beyond that, then we have art. Then we have design. Also, if you want to be more than the shirt machine, where money comes in and shirts come out and that's the only value we have is to be a commodity, to be someone who runs the machine, someone who has equipment, if we want to be more than that, if we want to be consultants, if we want to help people get solutions for what they need, that means that we're going to have to understand a little bit about the artistic, the aesthetic, and about design so we can get them to the results they want. Because yes, they're buying a shirt from you, but they're also buying from you what the shirt does for them, especially if you're in a commercial sense. 
if I'm if someone is buying a garment from me, usually they're using it to market themselves to look more professional to achieve an end. It's usually promotional. It could be. It could also be, like I said, to look more professional. It also has the function of the garment itself. But all these things come together with artistic knowledge, technical knowledge. And so it's not art versus science. It's art and science. It is the technical and the aesthetic put together. Because what are we here to do? We're here to make shirts, make garments, make hats look better, have a design on them for a purpose. Now that purpose can be, if we are just doing something that's interesting, that looks nice, that is cool, that makes people happy, It the purpose can be for it to look cool, for me to identify with something I like, for it to be decorative, that is a purpose we can be achieving. But there's often also a further purpose, especially in the commercial side of things where it's identifying a company, promoting myself to someone, giving a certain look or feeling to people wearing this garment that I want someone else to pick up on, these purposes are achieved by knowing things about art and design, by knowing things about the technical side of it. And in fact, the technical side of it is kind of the price of entry. If you want to be able to make embroidery that works, if you want to achieve a result, the technical side of it has to be maintained for you to get to the artistic side of it, for you to do something more than just reproduce. And I've got some, you know, I've got some other images and things we're going to talk about later. We're certainly going to talk about design, alteration, stuff like that. But at first, I just want to kind of define some terms. I know that might be not necessarily everything you want to hear is that I'm going to do some lecturing first, but you know, we are going to talk about other stuff. And like I said, design deconstruction is going to keep coming. I would like to get into the why I care about this stuff as much as what we're doing. So yeah, I like this comment from Jeff. Yeah. If you're not doing color by number, if you're doing connect the dots, if you're coloring by number, if you, like I said, you're filling in shapes with stitches and you don't care how they go, that's not what we're talking about here, but I'll, I'm going to say this. Anyone can do that with a very minor investment in understanding. If you go beyond, if you do something artistic, you increase your value to a customer. And honestly, I just think your embroidery is going to be more dynamic and look better. Um, and, you know, I'll, not that we're not going to talk about this repeatedly. I could have taken this carousel horse that was generally one color. I mean, I'll show you the art and it's not exactly that simple. Generally one color, I could have filled the entirety of the horse in one color, one fill stitch, one direction. There's nothing telling me that I, that I have to break this up in different shapes. But when you see the light play off the different shapes that are in this horse, because I decided on different stitch angles and stitch types. And by the way, all of the base color of that horse is one thread color. That is not multiple colors of white and ivory. That is one with some gray shading and outlining work. When you see that light play, you can't tell me that there's not a higher value in this than if I had filled the horse from top to bottom in one horizontal fill. This looks like it costs more for a reason. So the artistic side of it, I think is still important even in a commercial sense. I'm, I'm gonna fight for that. <laughs> I still think it's important in commercial sense. And I'll, I, like I said, I'll show you stuff that is not so detailed and so technical as that piece in order to make that clear. But I still think that's a valuable thing to consider. There is value to it. Let's go ahead and get again into kind of this, this whole concept. So the two sides of this thing, as I see it, as I'm defining it here, are the artistic and the aesthetic. What looks good? And there actually is utility to this. There is function to this. We're going to get into that. Design stuff. Stuff that we're talking about where it's more graphic design than art as you might think of it. You know, you might think of art as framed pieces, as paintings, as imagery. But part of this art, artistic and the right why I said aesthetic is also the idea of design things. We'll talk about it again later. But, you know, the way we handle a typography, the way we handle layout, the way we deal with hierarchy, and I'll discuss that again, the way we make something more intelligible to the viewer is aesthetic. Because we could completely just reproduce what someone hands us. They, they throw us an image off of their website. They throw us a business card back in the day, and they give us a logo. And we could just reproduce it at the size that makes it work. But part of this is also how we handle it in, in situ, on the site, where it is supposed to be. How is it going to look best on a hat and be visible and legible to the person who's going to read it? That's part of this aesthetic. So I think it goes, like I said, it goes more than just artistic. We're going to talk about the artistic side of it. But there is this aesthetic side of it that is also giving us utility. It's letting us understand how we have to make changes to make things more legible, to make it make sense in the place where it is, in the layout where we have to be, in the area that's available on a particular garment. 
these things are part of what I consider aesthetic or artistic choices to some degree. Now, certainly there's other artistic choices like color choices and shading and how much detail you put into something. Those are artistic as well, and we'll get into that. But I think that too many people will think of the artistic side of it as, hey, man, I, they give me a, a logo and I reproduce the logo. I'm not making decisions about that. The thing is, this is an interpretation. We'll go there again. You are going to make choices that change the look of this thing. Even if you're just saying, no, they give me a logo and I spit back out the logo. Because we are not dealing with print, because we are not reprinting something that exists, and because changes have to be made for our medium, we are going to make choices that affect the look of this piece. Aesthetic choices, even if we don't really have an awareness that we're doing it. The other half of this thing, the other side of this, when I say the art and the science, is the technical and the material. Um, so when we're talking about it, I say science, it's not scientific, right? This is why I put little scare quotes here. It's not necessarily scientific other than by paying attention to the numbers, to the values, to the way things work, there is a scientific edge to it. It is technical. We have to understand these things in a technical way. We sometimes have to learn specialty terms. We have to know how embroidery is constructed so that we can use the embroidery well. We have to understand things like our distortions, the way that things work on the machine, the way the machines work themselves in order to control them. And we have material concerns. You have to understand the difference between running on a woven smooth garment that doesn't have a lot of stretch and running on a thick knit garment with a certain kind of rib knit pattern and what kind of grain it has, how lofty it is, how much it sinks in, how much pull composition it needs. These are material questions. Also things like stabilizers and toppings and thread tension. These are material technical things. And you'll say, Eric, what does that have to do with digitizing? Well, kind of, kind of everything to, because to a degree, even if there are things that we can't control, the best of us as digitizers are going to be making recommendations, or at the very least, we will have an understanding of what is the appropriate material to use to make things work, or the things that we have to do in our designs, especially as we were talking about, like, say, underlay, or coverage, or maybe even color contrast, so it, it overlaps a lot with the artistic side. What are we going to have to change in our settings, in our control of stitches and their variables? density, underlay, pull compensation, stitch angles, what are we going to have to change in order to make something come out with a result that we want? That is a material or a technical thing you have to discuss. Also, the operation of the software itself. I know I often put that in the third position when we're talking about like artistic concerns and other concerns. When you're learning digitizing, I always put that last, not because it's not important. Obviously, you have to know which buttons to push, and it's very important. But if you don't understand the why of pushing the buttons, I can only teach you take these steps to get this result when you want a new thing. When you're trying to figure out a new thing that you've never done before, a new method, a different kind of art, a different kind of marks you want to make, a different way to handle value or filling a space with stitches. If I don't teach you why stitches work together in a certain way, or if someone hasn't tried to kind of get you beyond that or teach you the base material, how things interact, then all you get from the button pushing is, okay, I need to make a letter. Which buttons do I push to make the segment of the letter? And if I don't break down the why and the wherefore, when you want to make something that's not the letters you've already seen, you may not think you can do it, even though you essentially have taken control of all the tools it'll take to make this new image that you've never tried. So there's the technical and the material. You have to understand this stuff to get results. If you want to be able to control the machines, this also includes, like I said, machine operation, how machines understand the, the uh, stitch file and how they work in general. If you don't know how machines work, if you don't know how stabilization works, if you don't know how hooping and how um, materials can affect the outcome, then there's a lot of things in digitizing you can't help with, you can't control, you can't mitigate the circumstances, these distortions that are present always when you're embroidering. I mean, we're we're stabbing a piece of material thousands of times with a needle and leaving loops of tensioned thread in, the, in it. There's a lot of forces at work here. We're not going to understand these all from some perspective of physics, or at least I'm certainly not. I'm not in that level. However, we are going to learn this technical stuff if we want to be able to control what happens on the machine. And something you guys know, I work in Brilliance. One of the things I really love about the materials we have, uh, Brian Bailey, creative in Brilliance, his manual goes into a lot more than just pushing buttons. It's one of the reasons I love our manual. That manual is a digitizing manual that happens to go into which tools you need to use, right? It is an embroidery manual that happens to tell you how to achieve it in a certain software. And not all materials, not all classes are gonna go there with you. You may find that people are just telling you, if you want a circle, 
click button three from the left on this bar, grab, click, drag three centimeters, let go, now here's your circle, click this, now there's stitches in it, click this, now you have an angle. Yes, that teaches you how to use the stuff. It doesn't teach you why you do the distortion, what's going to happen if you click something else, what you want, what the stitch type is made out of. And if you learn individual stitches, if you learn how they operate, you can do things that weren't necessarily intended by the tools, or you can use the tools in new and innovative ways, which I think is useful for creative interpretation. So I'm going to jump out and uh, give somebody a couple, we have a couple more comments in there. I'd like to give people a chance to jump in here. And it also breaks up all of my speechifying, as it were. It gets me off the soapbox for a second. Uh, Jenny says, the horse stitch out is awesome. Thank you. I like that one. It's one of my favorite pieces. And I'll be honest with you, have I done a preponderance of work that is of that size and detail? No, I was a commercial digitizer. What I've done the most of, left chest logos. And I've got a lot of those. And I can show you some of those, but I, I'll say this, even left chest logos and little patches and items, I have a tendency to take that same mindset into it. And I'll, I'll show you one that I had on my uh, Facebook page recently that people want me to break down and which may be part of our next design deconstruction. Uh, Christine also says this, uh, you have to remember that when someone gives you a logo, they're trusting you to have the knowledge to make it look the best it can. If you just spit it back out, you're not offering the best service to the customer. Yeah, truthfully, and you may find that the alterations to the logo serve their needs the best, especially when we're talking about the small text thing. I've always said handshake distance used to be three to four feet. Now we've got the social distance, which is six feet. If something's supposed to be legible at six feet, just because I can technically reproduce something uh, four millimeter lettering with 40 weight thread or smaller, you know, with 60 weight, doesn't mean I should. <laughs> Just because you can do something doesn't mean you should and doesn't mean it serves the customer the best. Uh, Jeff says, I love the Imbrilliance manual. Yes, me too. Absolutely. Also, you should check out the other stuff. Brilliance.com, you'll find Brian has written a lot of things like a Hitchhiker's Guide to Embroidery and his Start Here man manual. Uh, entirely cool stuff that is in that realm of understanding what you're doing before you step in. Uh, their tool knowledge is important. Software tool knowledge is important. You need it to close the gap because you can't draw until you know how to use the tools. However, if you don't understand what's going to happen to the fabric when the needle goes through it and makes a stitch, if you don't understand what happens when the stitches start to stack together in a certain order, you probably won't be able to control them when you want to make them do what you want them to do. Even if you develop the eye for it, even if you know what you want, you have to understand how the stitches will operate if you want to control them on the machine. So let's let's go back into kind of the discussion we were having here. Uh, and here's the thing. We, we did, we've talked about this, artistic versus aesthetic, we have the science, the technical material. And now I'd kind of like to jump into you know, interpretation versus creation. <sighs> Embroidery digitizing is interpretation. People are largely going to bring us art or even select art that is already created and we're going to work from that art. We are not generally going to whole cloth go and design our own stuff. There are differences. People who are making their own stock design lines. Um, like I said, if you go to theonlystitch.com, that's a few pieces that I've made myself or I've interpreted stuff from Viking Age art that I've cleaned up or changed myself. Um, those are things you create and that's cool. Most of the time you are not going to act as both the designer and the digitizer. Someone brings you a logo and you need to realize that in thread. The thing is, there's more creation in it than people want to say. So once again, I'm setting up interpretation versus creation, and I'm going to tell you that it's not it's not a binary like that. The, you are definitely interpreting something that exists, but as you interpret, you're going to do things that are creative. You are going to change things that that don't exist, or it's something to think. You're not gonna you're gonna change the logo by creating things that don't exist. A two dimensional logo doesn't have stitch angles. It doesn't have layers. It doesn't have something that's on the bottom and something that's on the top and something that's higher than that. It definitely doesn't have 3D foam or applique or a difference between the texture in one area than another. These are things that are only going to happen in thread. So even if you don't think you're making these decisions or even if you're making them kind of on autopilot because someone has told you anything of this size is this kind of stitch type, even if it was me. <laughs> the truth of the matter is you are doing something creative. You are looking at a logo and you are deciding it's not currently in thread. How will I render it in thread? And you can make different choices that still end up filling the same shapes with stitches. You can fill the same shape many ways. Obviously, like I talked about with the horse, the carousel horse stitch I just showed you guys. You can fill the same area with stitches in innumerable ways and come out with different looks. So the interpretation is there. Whether or not you're exercising it actively, you are doing a creative version of that interpretation because you're adding qualities 
that weren't there in the original art. So is there an artistic end to this? Yes, even for the most bone simple logo digitizing, you are absolutely doing something creative and you bring your eye for embroidery to it. And I've got an episode about developing the eye for embroidery. Go back and check that out. It's worthwhile to look at. Um, and certainly I'm not the only person teaching this stuff, but you know, I usually give you my own stuff because then I can answer for my own education. <laughs> if you don't like it or if you have something you wanna talk about, you can come back to me and say, Eric, I don't know that I understood what you meant by stitch consciousness and we can have that discussion. Um, but yeah, go back into the stacks for the take up and you'll find me discussing developing that eye for embroidery. And what that means is when you look at an image, you start to think about how do I break this image apart into the constituent shapes that I will need to fill with stitches to make this thing work with embroidery. Eventually you'll look around the world and every billboard, every logo will Im immediately break up into planks of fill and curved fill and straight stitch and bean stitch and satins and breaks on each of the satin lines. You'll start to see everything that way when you develop that eye, but that's something that takes time. So what I'm saying is it is a creative act. Are we taking someone else's art and working with it? Yes, are we developing shape? Maybe not. We develop a lot of texture, a lot of value. We work with different ways that we're going to achieve shading and gradients and color because we have the limitations of thread. Thread being like working with a colored pen more than working with say pencils or paint. We cannot blend the way you do with a fluid. You know, that's not how we're able to do. We have to work very much more like we're working in pens. And so that line becomes more important to us and we have to do something different, especially when we're working with photographic sources things that are with a wide range of values. We have to make decisions on how we handle that. However, even if we're working on bone simple, solid color, no gradient logos, we are absolutely making creative choices when we do so. And that means that understanding more about our medium, about thread, about how it looks, how it works, and knowing a little bit about our design work can help. Because the thing is, even if we aren't trying to make changes to the logo, we may have to make certain changes to make it work for the space available or to do things at the size it needs to be so it works in thread, which means understanding a little bit about design and typography and layout uh, will help us get there. So these are the things I wanna talk about when we're talking about the creative, the kind of the creative side of it. Uh, number one is line pattern and value. We're talking about mark making, right? And I said that methods of mark making, what does that just mean? Literally what it sounds like, making marks. How are we going to, make a mark and start to show values or lines or shapes on whatever substrate we're working on. These are methods of mark making. The thing is, as we know, embroidery is a point, a line from, from one side to the next. Unless we're dealing with a chenille machine that has loops and even then it's a certain kind of line we have established, we have lines. We can work with those to establish patterns, whether this is motifs, whether this is a fill stitch. A fill stitch is coverage, but it still has texture and it still has some pattern to it because the pattern of stitch penetration points changes what it looks like. A randomized pattern looks rougher and more organic. A regular pattern looks smoother and uh, more mechanical, more artificial. And that is just how it works. We have patterns in there. We also have value. How close together things are, that's our density. How close together lines are, just like on engraving work. And actually, I'll bring up a piece since I have a bunch of my samples with me today. You know, here's this piece. And this is all done in one color, but we have value. We have areas that are darker. We have areas that are lighter. These are all achieved with lines. We have dots. We have patterns of lines and our, my auto focus is going crazy because I can't hold still. Um, but this is all done in an engraving style and that is handled with lines. We establish value by how close together lines are, how tightly packed they are in an area. That's an artistic thing. If we were drawing with a pen, it'd be the same thing. This is an artistic thing to think about. And when you think about stippling or shading or hey, silk shading and embroidery, which is an embroidery specific thing we talk about. Uh, when we're talking about trying to leave color into each other, that kind of stuff, that is artistic. And we may interpret something that is, like I say, photographic in any number of ways. It, it has an, a ma massive wide range of color. If it's something like an oil painting or a photograph, we're going to have to decide how we use lines of thread, how we intersperse them, how we use different densities of filled areas in order to render this thing that actually has millions of colors or thousands of colors that we can't really reproduce in thread, or at least we can't reproduce ideally. So line pattern and value, these things are important even when we're dealing with color. And we'll talk about color again, but the way we handle lines is really pretty important. Plus when you think about the thickness of lines, what's the difference between using say a doubled stitch or a bean stitch, a single straight stitch, 
a satin stitch column, which becomes a thick line, even though we're turning the stitch angle when we do that, uh, or when we use variable thickness in satin stitch lines, where we start and end at different thicknesses, and we use those values, uh, or, and also just the weight of that line to show something in the embroidery, or how do we handle that? How do we achieve the thickness? What are we going to do for thinner and thicker lines? These are all kind of artistic choices that we make because there is no stitched line in your art. There is a thicker line or a thinner line or a rough line, a sketchy line or a smooth line. And we have to figure out how to render those things. And it's an artistic decision, just how close we try and get or what we do on our side and how we mitigate the, the natural texture of thread to make it look like our art or to create something that maybe surpasses our art. So methods of mark making are important. Let's go to embroidery specific techniques. So this does get into, like I said, silk shading, gradients, using different densities and interleaving them. Uh, the randomness of pattern, like I talked about before, if you're filling an area, but you want it to have an organic look, uh, you can use the randomness of pattern. You can overlap different segments of embroidery to get texture. These are embroidery specific techniques. And the thing is, they are not going to very likely be specified by your art. These are things that you have to choose. So this is where we do get into artistic uh, sense of using our media. And that's really, it's media specific potential. Your thread, it has shine or it doesn't. It has different levels of shine and sheen. Thread angles determine the light that's reflected as we saw in the sample. And it can uh, indicate more than one color or it can just make something look faceted. The direction of, of stitches, the direction, the angle of inclination can change um, how something follows a curve, how something follows a shape in the embroidery. That's embroidery specific. And it is down to the way thread works, the way light reflects off the thread. And it goes into the technical, but it is an artistic choice that we make. It goes into the technical. And actually I'm gonna bring up something that's, uh, like I said, I think I'm gonna be doing an analysis of another design here soon because I've been asked over and over kind of to do that. I'm gonna go ahead and pop up my screen so you can see it. This is a piece that I've shown before uh, and it is something pretty innocuous, right? It's a flying monkey, right? Think, think, <laughs> think of the flying monkeys from Wizard of Oz. But here's what I'm going to tell you about this very simple patch that I did. When this art came to me, there was no texture in these wings. It was a complete, you know, it was completely in an untextured flat uh, setup. You know, this was all silhouette. So with it being a silhouette, with it having no texture whatsoever, I'm making all these artistic decisions about how that works. And as we zoom into it a little bit, you can see these wings are built up of different shapes. This is a choice that I had to make. It's artistic. You can also see there's media specific potential. When we're using a curved fill that's here in this, uh, in this sleeve, you can see how it makes it look more like fabric, more like it's following the curve of the natural object that's there. You can see how I've used stitch textures in the wing and broken them up where we have uh, we have a fill that's following this turning fill, this kind of radial fill. We have these overlap satin stitches for feathers, and we're notating something that's interesting. Plus, we can see here there's randomness in some filling that I've done on the head so that it looks like curly hair without having to individually render that in the face. But we do get a little bit of that. We also have satin stitches breaking up the mouth, the top and bottom of the mouth here. And like I said, I, I'll go into deeper detail if we ever break this thing up and I'll talk about how I put it together and the choices I made. But you can see that this is the artistic side of this and this is the potential of the media. This is the embroidery specific potential that isn't going to be present in your art necessarily. Or even if there are lines and shapes in the wing, you have to decide how stitches are going to show that and especially, let's say we had little divisions drawn in here with lines that were so fine that they weren't going to show up, we might elect to use the texture of the embroidery to make that happen. So that's our art. That's where we're talking about artistic rendering. That's where we're talking about something that's more than just the technical side of it. That's where it's important to think about our medium and think like artists, to have a palette of settings and stitch types and concepts so that when we come to a piece of art, we are going to render it in a way that is uh, compelling and develops visual interest. The thing is it's subjective. You totally could have filled those wings with a fill in one angle and it wouldn't have been wrong. Wrong, you know, it's not gonna be wrong to do that. You know, it's not gonna be wrong to render something in a simple angle instead of spending the time to do that. And some people will say, you know, on a job that I'm not being paid a certain amount for, I don't wanna put that much effort into it. I would. I would say, you know, yes, there's a little more drawing effort. I think that it actually saves stitch count sometimes doing it the way I just did that. 
a lot of those satin stitches are going to be better than filling those with fill. The fill would have actually taken more time to run. So we can talk about efficiency in that whole myth. And that, that's another um, technical thing to talk about, certainly. But I'll also say, I think that patch has higher value than if I fill it flat. And I will absolutely corroborate the fact that I had people pay more at my shop to get that kind of treatment than to go somewhere else where they just filled in the areas that were present in the vector. So, you know, like I said, I think this is important enough. I think it's worth looking at, and I think it's something we can talk about. But we'll go back into this just for a little bit to finish up the artistic side of it. So we talked about media-specific potential. What can thread do that print can't, and how is that important? What does that do to add value? Other things I think we should talk about, color theory. Um, you should know a little bit about it. I'm not awesome with color, but I do know that certain colors pop off of other colors. And when I'm doing something like gradients, and uh, I may try and bring this up, and let me see if I can grab this one, because I think this is, uh, it's worthwhile to show it. You know, but I would say this, we're talking about gradients, you may have to talk about what family of colors that you're in, and what does that mean to the way things are gonna turn out in your eventual piece. And you know, I'll, I'll go ahead and pull up an image, and uh, this is actually something that I've taught, about, taught before, so you'll probably see it. Well, let's go ahead and pop this up if I can. But when we're talking about working in color blending, working in a certain family of colors, you need to know things like hue and saturation and value, because though it looks like, wow, okay, Eric, in, in the two inches, you've managed to go from, you know, you've got like seven colors in a two inch piece here, and I don't have, I guess this is the best image I've got right now. Sorry about that, folks. But you're gonna see that I'm going from purple all the way to gold in a two inch you know, section of this fill. And yes, it is purple to gold. However, if you put this in grayscale, you would see, if you put a grayscale filter over this image, that these colors have a very similar value despite the hue changing. They have a similar saturation so that I'm not necessarily making a whole lot of contrast happen. And because of knowing a little bit of color theory, not a ton, I'm getting a better result out of that gradient than if at some point here I had said like, okay, in this orange, I use a super saturated fluorescent orange. Yes, it would still be orange, but it would absolutely pop out too much and it would clash with this very pinky reddish color that's next to it. You wouldn't get the same smoothness. And that comes from learning a little bit about color theory when you're making your color selections. So if somebody shows you a rainbow gradient, yes, I can sample out of the gradient and kind of get as close as I can. But to do this in thread the best way I can, and I know that I don't have infinite colors, I'm going to have to do this blending in a way that makes sense for what I have. And what I have with embroidery, by the nature of the beast, is limited colors and an inability to blend more than just putting lines of stitches close to each other. This means that with that limited range of colors I can use or how many needles I'm willing to devote to this gradient as well, uh, and how much thread changing I wanna do on my machines and how many cones do I have in these ranges, being able to carefully select your gamut and the colors that you use is going to give you a better result. So knowing a little bit about color theory works. Also remember that you're stitching on garments. If you look at in the uh, links list, one of the things we were talking about in there is stitching on uh, garments of certain printed patterns, is stitching on garments of different colors and how you have to handle that stuff. Well, knowing a little bit about color theory and what colors are going to pop off of other colors, how to achieve contrast or what it means to have something tone on tone or tonal versus something that has really high contrast. Like we know if we're going on like a blue or a purple garment, we can use a nice gold and have that be very much opposite on the, you know, complementary on the color wheel. And honestly, looking at a color wheel, knowing what a color wheel is saying, things that are opposite on the color wheel are going to have a really high contrast. Sometimes they'll be clashy, understanding how different groupings of color work. Um, it helps you select colors and you'll say once again, well, the logo is this color, true, but you can work with value or you can help somebody also select a garment that works well with their color scheme or help them to understand what kind of values of color in their range are gonna look the best. And especially with digitizing, it'll help you to do shading better. One of the things that we often do as digitizers is we get that cartoon effect where we have a tendency to put that black line on everything to shade, whereas we could choose a different dark color that wasn't black and get a different value and a different kind of feeling. And you might not have that harsh contrast, but a lot of us don't think that way. We think about outlining in, in black pen, as it were, instead of doing that stuff. Knowing a little bit of color theory might help us get that and also make choices when there are potential color choices to make that are not on the, you know, on the books that aren't part of a uh, necessarily like a uh, style guide for a company, especially when we're making our own stock designs, that color theory is going to help us select colors better. And we don't, like I said, you don't have to be just so deep into it that you're out there, you know, mixing colors for Pantone. I'm not expecting it to be like that, but it does help. Uh, the other kind of things I think we should think about are design topics, topics that are about 
uh, graphic design and layout, things like that. And for, for what I've already shown you, you go back and look at the jargon episodes. We talked about typography, understanding the parts of a letter and how they go together. Also, the way letters are laid out and shaped helps us to digitize characters better, whether it's lettering or a font. If we understand how to balance characters optically, that's great. We understand that round characters look a little shorter than characters that have flat tops on them, so we have to make them a little taller. We will make those adjustments and maybe even exaggerate those adjustments in embroidery to make things look nice and to have straight tops and baselines uh, whenever we create. So I think typography is important. Also, when you're trying to search for a font, understanding what the name of the font is or what type of font that is and how designers name it will help us find our assets easier. If I know what a serif font is from a sans serif and I know what a grotesque font is, I know what an old style font is, I know what black letter is, it'll make it easier for me to find what I need or if I'm looking for a certain kind of feeling to look up new fonts if I'm designing for myself. So some things about typography are interesting to know. Uh, the nomenclature of what goes into a, a letter or a glyph is one of them, but the other one is just literally knowing the types of fonts that are out there so you can find them easier. Visual hierarchy. Especially when we're talking about things that need to be seen, uh, knowing that having things that are larger or bolder may help them stand out and be read first if we're making our own design layouts. I think understanding visual hierarchy is important. And also for all of your marketing and your websites, uh, knowing what people will look at first is pretty important. And this is another big one, visual tension. I cannot tell you how much people need to know, especially in text, kerning is one thing. Kerning in text where you make sure you've got your spacing between letters so that they look good and you don't end up with big gaps or other spaces that make your letters not hang together. And that's something we've taught and I can show you visual examples, but for right now I'm gonna go past it because I think we're gonna spend too long on it. But visual tension is the other thing. You see two points really close together. Maybe two letters are coming together and a point looks like it's touching a line almost. And it's really tight in that one area, but the spacing is more even other places. Then that little area of tension where it looks like it almost is about to touch draws the eye and it draws the eye potentially away from other things you want people to be looking at. So understanding a little bit about visual tension is also important, and especially when we're laying out lettering. When we have, just like people say, kerning is weird because you might have things that are overly spaced so words look broken. It also looks bad if you've got some areas that are too tight and it looks like there's not quite enough room in between things. You don't have a little bit of clear space unless that's the effect you're going for that you're compressing things on purpose. One area of visual tension that's too tight, too tense together in comparison to others can make things look awkward. So these are things that I think are worth looking at. Once again, are we all gonna become graphic designers? Absolutely not. But when we're looking at something, we kind of have an idea of what looks wrong, what's causing something to look funny. Why does text look spaced wrong? Why don't the letters quite look the right way? Learning a little bit about that stuff or at least understanding what it is, is good. But here's the thing. As far as the artistic and aesthetic parts of this go, I can prescribe for you what I think looks better and you can decide what you think looks better. But ultimately the artistic side of it mostly is subjective. You can like a flat design that doesn't have all the carving and bits that I like to do in my pieces and, and feel that it looks better or that it's the right choice for a client. Absolutely. It is subjective, but what it does do is it changes the visual impact and interest of the design. So understanding that you have all these artistic options, understanding that colors work differently with each other. I mean, it can also be technical. You can talk about what it does to your design to be on different colors, things like that. And I'm gonna show you that article from Susan Hensel in a second to kind of show you a little bit about that. But we are essentially affecting the visual impact and the interest in the design. Does this thing draw the eye like it should? What parts of the design are drawing the eye the most? Uh, what is the first thing we see? And is that the most important thing that we want? What parts look too tense, too dense, too packed with detail? What can we even out? What should we space out? And why is that important? So visual impact and interest is, is worked on by the artistic side of this, by the uh, aesthetic side of this. And it's actually, I think it's worthwhile, but it is ultimately, to a degree, <laughs> subjective. I think some things really are better than others because they become technical. Be because once it affects things like legibility in the design, if the design's supposed to be read and it has text in it, then it being legible is important and that's pretty much hands down. Text is mostly supposed to be read. However, when we're talking about the way we render an image, whether or not my flying monkey has individual feathers or not on his wings, that's subjective. So the artistic side is more subjective by far. And uh, <laughs> By the way, I'm going to go ahead and go with a couple comments because we have to stop for that for a minute. But I love this. I love to get the comments in and I'm about to go into the science part of it, the technical part. Anyway. B Thrash says, I have to say 30 years of Adobe Illustrator use has helped me immensely. Uh, 
in my 10 years of using Melco now I'm brilliant digitizing anyone using drawings. It seems super. Uh, I haven't heard good things about it. I'm just going to say that, but I don't use it. So I don't know. There are people who work with everything. What I'm going to say this, I have seen people create what I consider masterpieces in every software that I've ever used. And um, honestly, that uh, that is including my own pieces. My own pieces are not better or worse for any software. In fact, I can show you. This was created originally. Now, this has been retrofitted with some new type. I actually do remember now that I, I did redo the type. But the original piece here was done in a DOS-based system called QDT, where I had to digitize most everything myself, like one stitch at a time, or at least in blocks of stitches that uh, did not have curves. You had to make any curve out of small segments of straight lines. Um, and that includes curves on satin stitches. There were no curves. It was done in 16 colors on screen, like I said, in DOS. And most of this was laid one stitch at a time. And it's one of the pieces people point to as my masterworks done very, very early in my career. But I did it with a lot of control over the individual stitches. And that's why it looks the way it looks. It was because I used a lot of control and I understood the stitches even before I had the tools to make it easier to use. Uh, and then we look at, you know, we look at this piece, you know, there's, if you look at that piece, that was done in another software. If you look at this piece, and I'll bring this up, this was done for um, the Netflix TV show Chambers a, a couple years ago, I believe is when it first came out. And this is all done in Stitch Artist uh, 2 and 3. And you could have done the entire thing, I believe, in 2. And it still has, look, look at all that shine. You've got different shapes that are in there. You've got different angles. You have these shadows. And this is all done in Stitch Artist from Brilliance. So, all of these softwares will produce beautiful embroidery if you know what you need. If you know what you're looking for, you can find the tools to do it. And honestly, even that big piece, once again, even this piece, let me show you how many specialty stitches are in this piece. This big piece with all the stuff and all that visual interest, this uses fill, curved fill, satins, auto length limit split satins, and uh, individual straight stitch. That's it. Maybe a little bit of manual stitch as well. This could be produced in any of the softwares I've ever touched. It's not the software that makes this happen. It's the understanding of the medium and the interpretation of the art. Uh, software has tools that makes things make things easier or harder as far as time. They make things faster or slower. And by the way, in fact, this is the thing I'm going to say this to. Maureen asks, how long did the Pizza Man take to digitize? I'm going to tell you that that's not important. And, and you're going to say, really? How, the hours and hours or whatever? I did this in a software that doesn't exist anymore that was on an incredibly slow computer, you know, nearly 20 years ago. It took a long time. It took many hours to digitize, partially because I was also figuring it out as I went along. Because it was early on in my career, and I'd never done a piece that looked like it when I first worked on that. That was the most detailed piece I've ever done. And if I were using you know, in brilliant software right now that works reliably on a faster computer, I would not have been struggling the way I am now. And I could see what I was doing. There was no 3D preview back in the day. There was no stitch simulation player until I was done with the file. So honestly, there were tools that I didn't have then from now. And frankly, I'll say this too, that design was run thousands of times before it was done. I, I think at least a thousand times before it was done. It was modified. I did a version wherein I put color behind the entirety of each of those stitch blocks and we made an entire revised version that was run again for all of the units and all the corporate people who worked for the Dion's uh, Pizza Company. Uh, and so that piece ended up having a longevity that if I look at it and go, it took me 20 hours. Yeah, maybe it took me 20 hours, but we had that client for two decades. Um, there's a, <laughs> there's a limit to how much it matters. And I'll also say that truthfully in the software, um, the software has changed so much. I couldn't even, it, it would make no sense to you how long it took me when I did it originally for sure. Uh, but let's go ahead and go, go a couple more questions before we get into the technical stuff. And then, like I said, we may not be able to do the full design breakdown. I, I interpreted that or, or I intuited that early that we may not get into the full design deconstruction. Since we won't probably do that today, I'm going to go ahead and just commit to you guys and say next week we will do design breakdowns uh, of some kind that are a little more deep, probably with the carousel horse. I think the flying monkey patch, because everybody got so interested in it and it's a simple piece, we'll do that. And we may even see if we can throw a logo in there too, but we'll do a why I made the decision I made uh, kind of issue there. We'll talk about that, but we'll lay the foundations for it, finishing up this technical stuff that we're talking about now. Let's go ahead and go over the last couple of questions here. I have a medium-sized Wacom tablet, also a folding touchscreen laptop. Do you use either of these to digitize? 
I am still pretty much a mouse and keyboard digitizer. However, I have more and more often um, used pen tablets. I now have a Wacom Studio. So it's like a Cintiq. It is a monitor that we use. I also have used a Cintiq. The piece that you're looking at here, and I'll actually bring that up, this Chambers piece was actually done on a Cintiq. So it was done on a big, like I believe it's a 24 inch Cintiq. Uh, and that's a Wacom style tablet. What I'm gonna say is none are better in my opinion necessarily. It depends on what's good for you. Lots of high-end digitizers like to use the pen tablets. I'm still a pretty much a mouse person because I like to let the mouse go and have that cursor stay where it is and not have the pen there. However, when I'm doing things that are organic, sketchy, uh, engraving style work where I'm tap, tap, tapping points and a lot of it's under my control, there's a lot of manual stitching, that's when I really love the pen tablet. When I'm doing geometric work, when I'm working on fonts, especially scalable fonts that are going to be used at multiple sizes, I am very much more comfortable with a mouse. Love the Cintiq, it does a lot of cool stuff. I also came up in an era where there was no such thing, where the only pen tablets we had were on the desk and the original ones I had were little five by sevens and we didn't really work with the big giant ones. When, when I had that limitation, I didn't find them to be very useful, but Studios and Cintiqs are awesome. They are, they are very useful. When you can see the graphic underneath what you're doing, then that organic work, especially doing, like I said, you're doing fur, you're doing organic, stuff with, uh, like I said, the engraving style work, you're clicking a lot of little manual lines, as long as you're very careful about having a grid in front of you so you know the space between the lines and you know what kind of density you're achieving as you draw these little lines, then it's good. The only problem I have with these guys as far as that is, lots of people will zoom in really tight and start tapping every little line they see, not recognizing that they're so close together they're producing a fill with more steps. Um, make sure you have a frame of reference and you always understand how far apart lines of stitching are and that you know how dark that value, how complete the coverage is that you're creating when you do that. Um, but yeah, lots of people like the Cintiq. I like the Cintiq too. I'm still a mouse and keyboard digitizer most of the time. Um, I will say I have to thank uh, my my coworker, Jim. He got me uh, a new um, a razor, uh, I can't remember the, the model of it, a keypad, a gaming keypad so I can put my macros on it. I usually like to stay just with my keyboard so that it's the same for mouse and keyboard as it is with tablet, but I am gonna try to mix in some of that too because I, I do like it for organic work. For geometric work, I really like going mouse and keyboard, but that also may be a, a factor of the way I came up in digitizing that I'm faster that way because I'm used to it. Um, doesn't necessarily mean it's better. It can also be that I've just got muscle memory built for mouse and keyboard. So yeah, I think that's a good thing to discuss. But yeah, Justin says, Justin, digitizer himself and as somebody who's digitizing professionally. So he loves his Cintiq. Cintiq's a great one. They are expensive. Uh, I cannot remember. There's a couple other companies who have similar ones. There's a company out of Korea that I will, if I remember it, I'll try and put it on here. For some reason, the name is escaping me. Um, and they have a a monitor style tablet that people are really enjoying. It still does have the, uh, unfortunately it's got a battery in the um, pen, which makes it a little heavier than the pens that you have for Wacom or Wacom. I don't know, depending on how, how you say it, but I say it Wacom anyway. Uh, they are a little heavier, I think, and heavier pen means a little more strain if you ask me. So the other thing I'll also say is be careful about the way you draw on the angle. You're a uh, Huayan, thank you. Lisa's correct, Huayan pen, pen tablets. I've heard really good things about them and some of my digital artist friends in the design world uh, will also use these. So that's something to definitely look at. Um, that is uh, possibly a, a less expensive version to get the Cintiq-like work. So I would say, um, however, I'm gonna say that the um, touchscreen laptops depends. Depends on how fine a, a pitch kind of that thing takes your digitizing and I would say, I like the dedicated monitors better or the studio better, but of course they're more expensive and they're kind of nicer gear. Um, just depends, but that's something to look into. I, I like the screen version best, so you're working directly into it, uh, but you can certainly do the tablet version. I did a ton of my stuff on a Wacom, the earliest version of Wacom Bamboo. Uh, I used pen tablet to do, like I said, organic work, engraving work, and certainly like fur and feather stuff if I was going to do a lot of manual work or um, foliage, grasses, things like that. Sometimes I would do that manual work there even if I were doing other geometric pieces with the mouse. Like I said, for me, mouse and keyboard is still primary, but I also do a lot of geometric work. All right, so with that, let's go ahead and I know bonus time, but we'll definitely be in bonus time today. We're gonna talk a little bit about the, what I would call the science 
portion of this. And like I said, we'll get into the design deconstruction. I'm sorry we didn't hit it today. We'll definitely kick into it next week. That's going to be how we how we address this. Um, might be a little different than what I planned for today, but we'll get to it. Uh, so the science portion of this, if we want to call it science, it's the technical part. It is the part of it that requires us to have technical knowledge to understand on a, a realistic basis how things interact and to understand our tools and the measurements and inputs that we have to put in to get out what we want. Um, yes, there's the artistic side of that, certainly. And there's a lot of overlap because understanding what settings, what variables in stitch types in our software will do to the look of the finished stitch type is a big thing. That is going to help us to make our artistic palette of effects that we want to get. However, the reason I consider it this the science portion is because it's not as subjective. If I am on a white knit garment and I'm stitching in black, there's a certain amount of density in 40 weight thread I'm going to need maybe a certain kind, especially with a certain kind of underlay to get a fill stitch to have complete coverage. And it's something that I can test and write down and reproduce. So though you can reproduce artistic styles as well, it's not as subjective. If I want coverage, I'm going to have a certain amount of density. If I want to avoid sawtoothing on the edge of my satin stitches over a certain kind of material, I'm probably gonna have to use some sort of contour underlay and underlay that runs near the edge underneath that column to help me stabilize it. Uh, if I'm going to run 3D foam, I need a certain amount of density to cut the foam so that it looks nice. Are, is there wiggle room? Can you use different densities to get different effects? You still can. There's still a lot of creative room there, but there's a certain amount of this that is technical that isn't up for as much debate necessarily. And uh, among these things is understanding our media. We have to understand the different media that go into embroidery because this doesn't have to be multimedia. This doesn't mean I'm necessarily doing print as well or sublimation. It can be. But it, we ultimately have multiple media we are working in with embroidery. We can call the media, you know, the media is embroidery, but these, these media are the thread, the fabric, and we can add to that kind of the bobbin thread as its own entity. We can add to that the stabilizer as its own entity. We can add to that any sort of other support materials or additional, and we are doing multimedia things like you know, applique, sequence, anything else. We have to understand how it operates and the different kind of functions it has in our work. So the media is where we're at for material knowledge. We have to know when I put a needle and thread through this garment, how is it going to react? When I stack a bunch of stitches on, on this garment and stab through it thousands of times, is it going to shift? How is it going to stitch? What or What angles are weak in it, what stabilizer, stabilizer do I need to maintain stability dimensionally so it doesn't stretch in any one given direction more than another? And how am I going to treat it? How am I going to hoop it? How am I going to keep it running the way I want it to? That's media knowledge. Also, how am I going to use my thread? Even though it's an artistic thing we end up with, we have to understand how the thread's put together. We have to understand how it works. Uh, it has different qualities. And I actually have an article I put in there about um, in the links list about working with single color designs and what are the differences we can still achieve even when we're working with one color. And the differences of, in our design elements are that we have the sheen of the thread can change. And that's with the selection of the thread. So we have the sheen, how shiny is it? How much light does it reflect and how? We have the, we have the texture of the thread. It's related to the sheen, but we can say we have, is it fuzzy? Is it smooth? We have that, we have the thickness of the thread. Are we using different weights of thread, thinner thread, thicker thread, and how does that affect our coverage and what densities do we need to change in order to make that run correctly or run in the way that we expect it to? And then we have to deal with things like how it runs literally through the thread system. They'd say, well, how does this do with digitizing? Well, of course, densities. And things like when we're using a kind of friable and easily broken metallic and there are metallics or threads that break a little easier under tension or you may want to have some larger stitches. You may lengthen your stitch length out. You may want to loosen up your densities in tight corners. These are things that you have to understand how they're going to operate. And the needle comes into this too, by the way. What needle does it need? What sort of uh, eye geometry makes the most sense for the kind of thread we're using? And at the very least, what, th what needle is recommended by the manufacturer that is both the correct needle for our garment, the correct kind of 
you know, tip geometry, and what's the right eye for passing through the kind of thread that we're using. If we've got a metallic thread, we might have a larger eye needle, or we might, or definitely we're using like a big thick thread, 12 weight cotton or wool blend. We're definitely going to treat that differently in our densities, in our stitch lengths, in and in the way we handle it on the machine. So understanding the thread is important. So we have thread, we have the fabric structure and texture. Absolutely without, I mean, if I, if I say something extreme, you'll get it for sure. Um, Poplin shirt and corduroy pants are not going to embroider the same way. The thing is that seems really easy to understand, but a, you know, basket weave piquet polo t you know, versus a rib knit t-shirt versus um, you know, some other polyester woven or polyester um, knit that has a different structure, they may actually treat things differently, especially when you're dealing with embroidery at very small sizes or you don't use any sort of toppings to mitigate texture. So the structure can manage it, matter. Also, an even weave material might be strong horizontally and vertically, but you pull on the 45 degree angles and it is weak, which might mean nothing. You'd say, okay, well, how, what does that do with my have to do with my digitizing. Well, if I digitize a bunch of 45 degree angle fills, it means it's going to be pushing and pulling on the weakest angles of the garment, the weakest angles of the thread. So it's going to cause more distortion than if my stitch angles were different as far as how the thread, the fabric rides. And as you guys will know, uh, generally we're going to have vertical and horizontal strength in that kind of woven garment, but we're gonna have that angular weakness. And understanding that means I might make different decisions in the way I handle my stitch angles to make it turn out right and not make all of my you know, circles into oblong, funky ovals that are wide in one direction, short in the other. Um, and certainly we're going to have to do some work on that no matter what, no matter what stitch types we use, no matter what we do for stabilization, there is some distortion that happens, but knowing that fabric works into that is certainly a thing. Also the loft of a fabric, and it doesn't have to be big lofty terry cloth loops to make a problem. It can be as simple as a uh, sweatshirt knit. If you put really small lettering on a sweatshirt, even a fairly smooth sweatshirt, it's going to want to sink more than it does on, like I said, a poplin shirt. It's just the way it's going to be. So understanding fabric structure and texture means we're going to make different decisions about pull compensation, stitch angle, stuff like that, and underlay, because we may use underlay structurally to hold up our top thread, especially if you have perpendicular underlay that's under our stitches. We're going to hold up our top thread with that underlay stitching. So that's part of what we can do. Stabilization, the kind of stabilizer we use obviously makes a difference to how things turn out. Um, yes, people love to tear away or wash away all the stabilizer, but it may change things. I just got done talking uh, in a group and several of us were all kicking in the same uh, topic. And it might, I believe it was in the embroidery nerd group where um, the embroiderer in question had a knit hat they had run separate letters on and it looked great until you put it on their head and then it went wacky shag and spread all over because the letters were now disconnected. Um, you could certainly have done different things to make this work out for yourself. You could use a knockdown stitch like we have in Enthusiast or a light mesh fill of some kind that you generate yourself in your software. And you could have made a field of stitching that held it all together or you could use cutaway stabilizer. She was using a tearaway. And the tearaway stabilizer, of course, isn't stable once it's gone. So the letters spread apart, the knit spread apart, and the letters looked crazy. But you wanted them to stay together in one field so that it looked good on the head. So it's something where stabilization made sense even after it was taken apart, even outside of the embroidery process. So understanding that is important, both for the embroidery process itself and for how we're doing things. The thing is, you can also digitize in such a way to enhance stability using global underlays working from the center out so that you don't have to use excessive stabilizers to hold something together. Stitching together your fabric onto the stabilizer with your underlay before you run, certain things you do differently with your sequence can make a design more stable so you don't have to use excessive stabilizer to make it work. So the, it's synergy again, the material and the digitizing goes together. Uh, stitch variables. And a lot of people will say settings. Settings happens in software, but the thing we understand outside of software is stitch variables. What are the variables in any given stitch type that change the way they look, right? Obvious one is density. Whether it's a satin stitch or a fill stitch, whenever we have a stitch that is made to cover an area, we have density, which is just the spacing between honestly doubled lines of thread. So the line out, the line back, and spacing to the third line, that is always going to give us our density. It's actually on the uh, the initial banner here, you'll see it hiding on my take up banner that we have our little measurement right next to my face that shows you how to measure densities because it's something I always talk about. It's one of the things that is the chief way of showing differences in stitches or making them look different is altering the density. 
the stitch angle, obviously, and especially what angles look like in reference to each other, as we saw in the original the horse, the carousel horse, um, debating, you know, when you're debating on whether dimension makes a difference and angles make a difference, well, obviously all those different facets of light are achieved by the fact that the angles are different from two areas that are next to each other and the contrast between those different angles makes different how that light reflects. So stitch angle is something we can do, we can change to make something look different. And so these are settings that we can use. Certainly underlay creation and the way those go helps with coverage. But these two things, density and angle, those are really huge with filling stitches and with all stitches, certainly stitch length is another thing. And the uniformity of stitch length, the uniformity of pattern will change things. Because if something has a more randomized pattern, looks rougher, more organic, has a, a uniform pattern, it's going to look smoother, more man-made. And for man-made items we're trying to show, might be making more sense. So that's part of that too. I'm gonna jump it out and grab a couple of comments because we we're kind of going a little bit long, but we've got some cool things to look at. Um, and here's here's the thing. Honestly, it's, uh, it's, it's not that you have to know all of this. <laughs> you will intuitively know this by studying embroidery. But I'm listing these things off because people don't really think about all these things that go into it. And sometimes when they get tripped up, being able to identify it and give it a name and see it may help you figure out what isn't turning out the way you want it to be. But I will go ahead and take a look with at our comments here too. And uh, Ramona says she started with the Intuos, talking about pen tablets. Intuos is a non uh, monitor palette. You could totally use those tablets that aren't on the monitor. If you can get used to the disconnect between the, the the icon or the cursor in front of you and the pen tablet on your on your desktop, then absolutely they're fine. And there's nothing wrong with them. I prefer the ones if you can afford them. They have the monitor in them for sure, and they work. Uh, so you said that's what I had. I had it many years for studying embroidery. Great for digital art. So yeah, if you're used to it, absolutely. Uh, Brian also says. Uh, Another thing that's important is the pens used to color in mistakes. Yeah, absolutely. There's nothing wrong with coloring in a couple of mistakes or a little piece of Bollinger that sticks up. Uh, if you go back and look, I have kind of a confessional video that talks about these things, including fire polishing, which I discussed with somebody recently via comments. Uh, there's a lot of things we do that might be, maybe aren't the things you want to do on every piece that you do to get the pieces out the door. But uh, Brian also says, and it's something I actually just said that I can agree. If that long list of things has you worrying about the complexity of embroidery, just breathe. He's got 53 episodes in the can to help you with all of it. We are here to help as well. And absolutely, um, here's the thing. Like I said, it's nothing to panic about and it becomes intuitive. The first time you sat behind the wheel of a car when you were young, if you are a driver, you had to do a bunch of different things all at once. And, and say an instructor was helping you out, they said, check your mirror, make sure your belt is right, check your, adjust this, side mirrors, rear view mirror, make sure everything's good. Are you clear? Look behind you, get ready, press the pedal in. Now we're gonna go ahead and shift. We're gonna go into reverse, we're going to back up. And now look behind you, check your blind spots, drive out. And all of these things in your mind when you were new were a cacophony of different things you felt like you had to keep attention on at the same time. But now most of us, you jump in a car, you sit down, you buckle your belt and you drive. The same way when you're looking at all these different things that I'm showing you, it looks like a, an endless list of all these different things to understand. It's more that I'm trying to show you the things that are going to take place in your embroidery so that when you're looking for all these different things, you'll see them. But once you start developing the eye for embroidery, they will become second nature. You will look at a design and just digitize. You will know this angle will work, this will not. I need to extend this border here. I need to extend this fill underneath this border because pull compensation means I have to deal with that pull and I don't want it to have gaps. And these things will come to you very naturally, very naturally, as you practice, as you understand, as you analyze. The thing is, when someone is telling you, hey, it's all about having an art degree so that you can do the artistic interpretation. No, nah, I wouldn't say that. But if someone also tells you, no, nah, really all you're doing is you take the design, you're making the design. There's nothing artistic about it. You guys are just stitch jockeys and you make things happen. It's not that either. And the best version of what we can do has the availability of more artistic expression than you think, even on a logo, even on a flying monkey. So when I talk about all this stuff, it really is more about knowing that there is this world of complexity that's possible for you and these things all factor in, but understand that you will not have to sit there and say, all right, 
visual complexity. We're going to look at this piece and there's some tension here and there's some stuff here and this is this. A lot of it will be, you're going to look at a design and you're going to say, text looks wrong. Word looks broken. This V looks too close to this T and it looks funky right here. It looks tight. But when you go to talk to a customer, you can say, there's a lot of tension right here. If I loosen that up, then it looks better. Uh, when you're trying to render some stitching and you're dealing with a photographic source and you're doing a gradient or some shading, you can look at it and go, oh, I gotta remember that's right. Um, when I'm putting a lot of lines together, there's a value. It's darker when they're closer together, just like density. If I start drawing a bunch of lines too much in one area, I'm gonna get a darker value than I intend. Maybe I should stop and draw some lines and see how close together they stitch and how they look when I stitch it out so that next time I wanna get about this dark with these many lines as close together, I know what it's gonna look like. Because eventually it becomes part of your hand, it becomes part of your muscle memory, it becomes part of your knowledge of embroidery and everything will become more normal for you. The other thing that helps with this is looking at embroidery and not just your embroidery, any embroidery. Look at embroidery, see how the thread works, see how people have decided to break up, let's say a letter into different shapes, different columns of satin stitch and understand what it is. Know that a satin stitch has two open ends and two closed sides where the stitches are actually dropping and what that means to how you use it in a shape. If you break it down like this, eventually you will get to the point where you can render artistic things, but you don't have to think about it with all of these terms. However, I like to make sure that when people make this argument, is it artistic? Is it technical? It's both. They all come together. And each one of these things feeds into making embroidery look the way it does. And if we take a moment to think about them, might be a little heady, might seem a little complicated to think about it, but each of these things plays into how we get the result we want. And if we understand each of them a little bit, if we think about them a little bit, when we come to the art as a whole, we can break it down. We can use actually these seemingly very complicated multiples of topics and say, oh, you know, I need to work on each of these things in a bite size. Say, okay, I'm gonna look at the layout. I'm gonna look at how the shading works. I'm gonna look at the density and the coverage. And we can actually address each one of these elements without being bamboozled by the entire design. In fact, when we do the kind of you know analysis I'm gonna do next week of this piece, that analysis will show you that when I first looked at this, this image altogether in the original image, which I'm gonna show you briefly, though we aren't gonna be able to get too far into it. The original image was photographic and in full color. And this thing didn't look like something I really wanted to digitize. And trying to figure out where do you start in this cacophony of shapes? Well, I made some decisions and discussed with my uh, client, if you will, with the magazine I was doing this for, how I wanted to render it, what I thought was important and what we could do to get what I talked about here, to get visual interest, to get hierarchy, to make one thing stand out above the rest. Because I thought this was, like I said, it's messy. It's a cacophony, too much is going on. And as a digitizer, which shape do you start with? Well, we'll talk about those decisions. The thing is, how do I get to those decisions? How do I get to thinking about that? By understanding a little bit about all the different things that go into it and then breaking it down into manageable chunks and thinking about how I'm going to render individual pieces. You don't have to digitize or stitch the whole thing and you won't. You'll digitize a line. You'll digitize an area of fill. You'll digitize a satin element. You will eliminate certain things. You will add certain things as you go and you'll make a new interpretation of the piece that's in front of you that makes sense for embroidery. And even I looking at this now, I have things that I would change, 100%. Things that I would do different looking at this piece from when I first made it. Pretty proud of it when it came out, it turned out okay. Believe me, I was sweating bullets when it was running for the first time. <laughs> and this one is a first and only. It's one of these pieces in the world right now. Um, so admittedly, it seems really complicated. And like I said, there's more things we can discuss in here. Certainly, we talked about stitch angles, density, everything else. It's all execution. You know, it's all how are we going to execute what we want to make happen here? And part of it is envisioning the stitches that we want, looking at the areas we have to fill and deciding how we're going to break it down. Certainly, there's the technical stuff. Distortion and compensation. Stitches get shorter as they run. Stacks of stitches get longer as they stack together. Absolutely the nature of the beast. It will always be that way. Uh, underlay has a function. It holds up top stitching. It provides more color coverage. 
It keeps stitches from sinking down into the pile of garments. Underlays function is something we should know. It doesn't mean we're going to be individually plotting all of our underlays all the time. And point of fact, if we have good software like our software, you may use automatic underlays for most of your work. But when we have a problem that can't be solved by automation, understanding how the underlay functions lets us create it ourselves with the other tools we have for making stitches. Uh, and, and like I said, as we know all of this, certainly we want to know all these things. We want to know why stitches are placed the way they are to get the result we want. But we also have to understand software operation because if you don't know how to draw a shape to put stitches in it, you're not going to be able to do any of this stuff. The thing is before, if not before, as important as knowing how to draw a shape is knowing why you need a shape there or stitches there and what kind of stitches they should be and how far apart they should be and what direction they should run in order to produce the result you want, whether that result is technical or at least the, the, your, main, your main concern is technical or your main concern is artistic. The first thing is knowing what the stitches do. Second thing is knowing where they go or where you would want them to go. And then we definitely need to know how to put them there. But learning the other direction or learning one without the other is somewhat futile. It doesn't give us the entire picture for sure. The thing about the technical and scientific side of this, if you want to call it scientific, is that it is largely objective. Uh, to a degree, if we don't have stitch links that work, we may break thread, we might have problems. If our stitches are overly long, it may be loopy or not look the way we want it to. There is something we're trying to achieve, and to achieve it is mostly objective technically. If we don't use the right stabilizer, it's not gonna stay stable. If I don't put the right amount of pull compensation, my stitches will be shorter, maybe my borders won't hit where I want them to, and it's objective. I can have it turn out wrong. Artistic stuff is more subjective. You can have it turn out a way that you didn't want it to turn out or that you want it to turn out differently. The technical stuff is more objective. It means that literally the border I wanted to be here isn't here. It isn't the where it isn't in the place I wanted it to be. The way I wanted this shape to look, I wanted a circle and I've got an egg. This is objective. This is something where once we figure out how to handle all of these variables, once we figure out how the material works, we can see objectively whether or not we hit our target pretty easily. And so that's the thing. The, the technical side of this, I don't like to say one is more important than the other. However, in order to play with the artistic side, in order to make more of your embroidery, it has to stitch correctly. It has to not break thread or break needles or run away with itself. It cannot have issues with um, basic registration, basic problems with the texture of the garment. The technical side is required to achieve the appropriate outcome from the digitizing. To, to get the appropriate embroidered outcome is really what I should say here. For the file to do its job, you have to know the technical side. For the design to be more interesting, for it to have more value, for it to be impressive and draw the eye, that can be the side that's creative. And we don't always have to go to the same extent, nor do we have to use the same style for everything. And part of how we achieve both of these things, in my opinion, is through design analysis, which like I said, I think we will cover that next week. We will get into design analysis deeper. I, I may show you a little bit of what we have here and I wanna show you a couple of the, the assets that I brought up in that links list. But the truth of the matter is ultimately, both of these sides come together to make these things that we want on, out of our designs, to make them look the way we want them to look, to make them function the way we want them to function. However, we have to have a solid base of technical knowledge. That's like the price of entry. The price of entry is knowing how stitches work, how they affect your fabrics, how that's going to run on the machines and how the machines function. These are the price of entry as we digitize. We need to know how that works, it's including software operation. We have to know whatever software we're using, how to make a shape, assign stitches to that shape, uh, and how to set the settings that give us the variables for the stitch type that we want. That's the price of entry. The next step beyond that is understanding what we can do artistically to make it more than that, to make it a creative interpretation, to make it special that it's embroidered. And so in that case, I'm going to say, we're going to go ahead and I think I'm gonna wind it down now. I'm gonna show you a couple more assets and stuff. I'm gonna go ahead and show a couple of comments real quick. But the ultimate thing to take away from this is both the artistic and the technical are important. 
the decisions we make are based on both the technical needs of our medium of the fabric thread, everything being put together, the stabilizer. Uh, we are making these technical decisions based on that. And as we digitize, we are never separated from the embroidery or the machine that starts it. But we can then go beyond and say, I want to make something that is more than just a reproduction of the printed art I've been presented. And it does mean that there's no difference between us and people who are doing say the hand embroidery work or other embroidery work. We are still making conscious choices that let us make creative decisions about how something turns out. We might not be doing it one stitch at a time. Sometimes we are, um, but we are still making choices creatively that change the outcome and the look of the piece, even if we're just doing it separated in time for when it, it stitches out. Um, certainly there's different levels of control for doing individual stitches. However, even if we fill an area with a tool that provides some automation, that, and the automation of filling an area is the basis level, it's the lowest level of automation we have. So that's the thing. Uh, you know, it, it is worth thinking about how that works. We are going to plot ahead, but even though the machine stitches later, we are still doing an artistic piece and we have the ability to control things about that look. And no matter what you do, no matter what you do, you're not just reproducing a print. You're not taking that vector and slapping that back out on a printer and out it comes. And there's still, <laughs> there are still things that change when you print something versus digital work. We are making an interpretation that has a creative choice. No matter what you do, you are making a three-dimensional object out of two-dimensional art. And in that process, there are creative choices you make even when you're not aware of them. Let's go ahead and bring up the materials one more time that I have in the links list, because I'd like to show you a couple things that I thought were interesting. Uh, first, if you want to take out the whole what is embroidery digitizing piece, it does talk very shortly about these different selections that there are and what I think it takes to learn uh, embroidery digitizing and why I think breaking up shapes and thinking about that is interesting. Uh, today, like I said, we had that piece from Susan Hensel, uh, who this is in the Surface Design Association, and she was talking about the effect of substrate color, the effect of the color of material on finished pieces. And she is a fine artist with a degree. And you'll, I, if you follow her, she does some really interesting stuff, but does mixed media and embroidery, digital embroidery, of course, like we do. And this is her using kind of a uh, two color accordion fill gradient on top of all these different uh, colored felts and then stacking them together and folding them and showing with this, she's using a trilobal thread and she talks about the different sheen of the thread and how it works. So listening to this artistic take from this is, I think is really interesting. You know, the artistic take from someone who is really examining color and how it comes out in an artistic way, not just in the way that we might do for logos or, re, you know, reproducing images that are given to us, I think is really interesting. So looking at Susan's pieces, I think worthwhile. And honestly, any of her work, she has a lot of folded kind of assemblies of embroidered uh, material that are very interesting. Very different from how we do with designs. This is surface design. She's decorating a surface and making marks in a way that is not how we make them when we're making logos. And especially these assemblages that she did are very interesting. So uh, Susan Hensel, and actually I'll go ahead and click on her link to susanhenselprojects.com. I haven't seen uh, what's going on with her other art here, but you're gonna see that she has um, all manner of textile art and a lot of this is embroidered. And I think it's really interesting to see it's not conventional designs the way we understand them, but that's something that's good for us to get into, to look and get kind of out of our, our usual spectrum of what we think of as machine embroidery. And by the way, I defy you, if you think that machine embroidery doesn't have an artistic side, I don't think many people here think that, but if you don't think that fine art can be machine embroidered well, uh, Susan's art, despite being perhaps abstract in, in its way, uh, is absolutely art and you can't say that it's not, in my opinion. Uh, so that's that's what I'd say. Go check out Susan's stuff, very interesting. And like I said, the original article is more about some technical stuff, but I think it really does just show you that you can get into the weeds if you want to. You can think about the way your materials go together if you want to and make something of them. And honestly, go check out some of her pieces because they're very interesting pieces. Um, also, like I said, we have the previous pieces from the take up that I linked here, embroidery analysis, which we're going to talk about again next week. That's episode 23. <laughs> There's my goofy face, but this is uh, episode 41, embroidery and prints, but it has a lot of things about uh, color. And in fact, what I love is there's some really cool color theory pieces that I do later on in here where we actually talk about color theory and we have um, discussions about like color groupings, things like that later on in this. There's a little piece about how colors look differently on different 
backgrounds. And I think that's important to the way we do things, even in garment and apparel. I think that's pretty great. You'll also find uh, shape creation and mark making that was in episode 18. So we'll get those together. Those are interesting. Uh, one of the pieces I showed you earlier, uh, we talked about like mark making. You see what lines are like stippling lines, curves, things like that. And that's interesting, I think, when we're talking about thread as line. Uh, my single color design piece where I talk about the different sort of utility that uh, stitches have and threads have and the way we apply them has. And actually, I believe I may even have this piece here to show you guys. Um, this is that embroidered Hanya mask, and it's not going to show up quite as well on camera. I'll go ahead and go full screen so you can see it. So that is one color of metallic thread. And all that dimension is just made out of stitch types, angles, curves. My ring light is giving it a little too flat of an aspect, but you can still see one color of metallic thread and all of that dimension comes from that. So that's something we can talk about. We, like I said, these are the kind of artistic things we can do with our embroidery or that we can understand about our embroidery. Um, as we said, uh, without going too deep into it, just to say, hey, different stitch angles, different stitch types provide different artistic backgrounds. And you know, this this is all the kind of stuff I want to get in your head, not because I think it needs to be overcomplicated, but because I think it's interesting. Like I said, we will get into analysis. We will talk about the, the monkeys since everybody wants to talk about that. Maybe I'll bring up some other things with wings to discuss that with you. And uh, honestly, the blending article, perfect blends from Images Magazine, everybody likes to talk about this one too, but it is worth understanding. Like I said, color theory helps us make that possible. So check out the links list when you get a chance. And I'd like to say uh, thank you to all of you who are still here and who have been here before and, and who are subscribed. We managed to get over a thousand subscribers, which is great. Uh, I really love to have you guys in here talking about this stuff. If you have any questions, if you have any comments, if you have other things you would like to discuss, I would love to have you in. In fact, I have, I'm going to go ahead and give a couple more comments. So I saw a comment come in before I shut down here. I would like to talk about uh, number one, number one, there's a couple, couple different things. First thing, Lisa Shaw says, uh, sounds like you're saying every design might not stitch well on every fabric must be a skill to digitize generically. Um, here's the thing. I think that there is a skill to it. It's not so much that it's a skill to be generic. It's that it is a, an intention that you have to have to get a all around design, but it means it's not perfect for anyone necessarily any one fabric, but you can get the best all around design and stock designers who are very good are good at that. So Lisa's totally right there. And by the way, if you haven't checked out After Hours with Lisa Shaw, go check out her stuff as well. I know I sent you guys doing brilliance.com to check out Brian's stuff, check out Lisa's stuff too. Uh, and I think that's fantastic to see that she comments on that as well. Uh, Jeff says, if I think people saw the torture their garments went through to be decorated, they'd be shocked. Yeah. If anybody understood how much we stretch hoop, glue and stab their garments before they get them. They might not love it, especially if they have any sort of uh, anthropomorphic nature. They think they're sad for the poor little garment. Uh, Jarita says, oh, you all are such a great group. Eric, Brian, and Lisa, thanks. Thank you, Jarita. And that's the thing. Jarita, who I saw her begin with no digitizing and I was doing like landscapes and shading and incredible stuff. Jarita says, I had no artistic ability or knowledge when I started this. I don't have an art degree either. I've had one drawing one class. That's it. Anything else is uh, on the either on the job or taught to myself. So these are things that, you know, even though I show you all this stuff, you might go, oh, it's Eric, he's real cerebral, and I'm sure it's probably part of his education or something. No, these are things that I picked up on the way from nothing to the height of when I'm digitizing the most, things that ended up being useful to me. So when I tell you this stuff, yes, it's complicated, but it's also because I picked it up over 20 years. And you're not going to know everything or need to know everything as you go. These are all things that I found useful to know about or that I think informed the, pr the production that I did. And I did commercial production. So it's not also just all artistic stuff. Cindy says, lots of good information. Now to break it down in my mind, let it simmer. That's the thing. Take all of this in tacitly and let it simmer. Things will pop up that are important for you. Uh, and Justin says, liquid embroidery. Yes, that's how I say uh, liquid thread touch-ups for the pens that are good for you. And uh, this is the comment that made me want to jump in real quick as well. Brenda says, I have a degree in graphic design. Very cool. And also a background in AutoCAD architectural drafting. So learning where they meet has been an interesting process to meld them into digitizing. And it's, it is absolutely because we're talking about embroidery digitizing at its core. We are controlling machines. We are making command sets for machines. We're not doing it the same way people who do in AutoCAD or people who are doing, say, other tooling processes necessarily do. We are using a more artistic bent to it. It might be a little fuzzier, perhaps, 
but we are controlling machines. And the day that we forget that we're controlling machines that are jabbing needles full of thread through garments, we may forget kind of the nature of what we're doing and may not get the results we want. And so this is very interesting. I like to see that you're here and thank you for showing up, Brenda. Really great to hear that. Uh, and like I said, I, I've actually found sometimes, sometimes, I'd say if you're doing drafting work and technical work, probably doing all right. But I found sometimes that graphic designers who work in print sometimes have a really hard transition to digitizing because they have to deal with materials in such a visceral way that they might not have thought about. Yes, screen printers have to deal with materials quite a bit, but especially like digital printers where the far end of that, once color profiles are sorted and everything might not be that hands-on, they sometimes have a little bit of difficulty because the fuzzy nature of thread and the things that happen when you do start doing all these tortures to your designs and to your garments can be difficult. So last couple of things, we had a great, a great couple of thanks. So thanks from Cindy. Thanks from Clorinda, from Frank, and hi to Curtis. But here, here's the thing, guys. Um, thank you for being here. Glad you were here. I know today was a little bit of a complicated episode of me talking a whole lot. What I'll say is absorb this stuff. Let it simmer for a little bit of the back of your mind. When you're actually working on designs, some of this will pop up. You'll think about it. You'll think about how to space lettering a little bit. You'll think about, hey, am I looking at my scale of measurement, do I know how far apart these lines are and how close that is? Am I making fills when I'm doing line work or digitizing? Uh, you're going to think about what kind of things are affecting your sample. Instead of just saying, oh man, my sample looks wrong, I better change digitizing. You'll think holistically about why. You'll think about sequence and about densities and about underlay, not just it's wrong, but why is it wrong? And is it wrong? And is this outcome going to teach me something that I need to know about something later? So let it simmer, let it work on you for a minute. Uh, and if you have questions, if you have comments, comment on any of the streams. If you're on YouTube, you're on Facebook, comment there. Go see me at ericcampbell.com. Go see the folks at Imbrilliance and myself. And if you have questions about that, since we came up a lot about that, you'll see uh, the material from Brian and Lisa there as well. Uh, and definitely check in next week. What you guys want to talk about is what I make shows about. Next week, we will get on to design deconstruction because I did promise that. And I'll break down the two that I showed you for sure. We'll go ahead and lead right into that. But we'll see where else we go with that. And like I said, any other comments, questions you have, find me on social media. And like I said, you are the reciprocators. And what you do, what you give back is what I'm giving back to you. So if you have questions, go ahead and hit me up. And if you love this, if you want to see it again, subscribe, turn on your notifications, share it with your friends. And I cannot wait to see you again next week.